arrogant man looked at him and said, surely you know what the tallest mountain in the world is. And the young boy said, uh, no, sir, I can't say as I do. And he said, well, surely you know what the biggest country, the most populated country in the world is, don't you? And the young man said, uh, no, sir, I, I can't say as I do. And he said, well, surely you know what the longest river in the world is. And the poor, uneducated Chinese boy sat back and said, sir, I'm, I'm, uh, sir, I'm sorry, I don't know. The man sat back and he kind of gloated at how he had all the wisdom in the world and he was so satisfied within himself. The river was wide and as the boy continued to roll, the wind began to pick up. And as the wind picked up, it started to make waves and the waves began to fill into the boat. And as the boy looked at the man, he saw the look on the man's face and it was a look of panic. And the boy looked at him and he said, surely you know how to swim. Surely you know how to swim. See, brothers and sisters, the man knew a lot of things, but he didn't know the one thing that would save his life. And when I read that story, I said, you know what? We as Adventists know a lot of things. We know a lot of things, and we're proud of it. But we don't know and understand the one thing that'll save our life. We do not know and understand the one thing that will save our life. And tonight we're going to study and see how we have been led to believe that we can climb a ladder and get into heaven. Would you kneel with me as we go to the Lord in prayer? Father in heaven, Lord, as we come before thy righteous and holy throne. Lord, we do so in the blood, in the name of Jesus Christ. Father, we recognize that we are so unworthy. And Lord, if we don't recognize that, Lord, I pray that you help us to see just how unfit and unclean we are. Lord, we desire to hear a word from heaven. Lord, I pray that, Lord, that you would cleanse me to make me a vessel that the Holy Spirit can use to share this most important message. Father, we understand that time is over. But, Lord, we are so undone. But the real problem is, Lord, we don't even know it. Lord, help us to see clearly tonight that our only hope is in Christ Jesus. Lord, I pray that as these words are shared, Lord, I pray that you would open our eyes, open our ears, and then, Lord, give us feet to move swiftly in the direction you show us. Lord, we believe. Help thou our unbelief. In Jesus' name, amen. <sighs> Victory over sin. You know, we study a lot of subjects. We talk about a lot of things. And the thing that made me begin to search this subject more than anything was I saw especially young people. And you know what? I invited some young ministers. I don't know if, I don't know if your parents will let you, but I invite all the rest of the little young ministers that I talk to like this young man right here to sit right up here in the front row. This is going to be so simple that I will guarantee you you will be the next one standing up here teaching it. So any of you young people that want to sit right up here in the front row, I got some questions to ask you. You know what? We need to make this so simple. See, we hear words like justification and sanctification and imputed and imparted, and we hear them in our mind, but as we walk out the door, we have no idea what they mean and how to put them into an active principle, a living faith in our life. We've heard them our whole life, amen? But how many of us can truly raise our hand and say that they have done something for us to where they're really, really making something transpire in our lives where young people look at us and say, man, I want to be like that minister. I want to be like that person. Because you know what? They know Jesus. See, the thing about it is, is I grew up in a home where it was like this. Highs and lows. Every time my parents went to a, a, a prophecy seminar, I knew 
that everything that was acceptable six months before that now was going to be totally unacceptable for the next six months. <laughs> See, we all laugh, brothers and sisters, because we know that we've experienced it in our own lives. The things that were acceptable, man, we were going to go through a whole time of trouble early. And then, after six months, it would be right back to normal. Everything would smooth out. I used to hate it when any seminars came anywhere close to where my parents would go. Up and down. Up and down. I'm not even going to ask you to raise your hand. Is how many have experienced that type of relationship with Jesus Christ. Tonight we're going to look at a subject that I have already said is the most misunderstood subject in the Seventh-day Adventist Church. Righteousness by faith. Victory over sin. Evolution versus creation. Now, when I say evolution, what comes to your mind? Monkeys. Isn't that what always comes to our mind? We see the evolutionary process of monkeys. Amen? What is evolution? The Big Bang. Okay. Okay. Is this what you think of when you, when, when you think of evolution? Is that what you think of? Is that what kind of the picture that comes into your mind? Okay. Okay. Now, we need to get a definition of what evolution is. Evolution is a process of continu continuous change from a lower, simpler state to a higher, more complex state. Better stay. Did we get that? Let's read it again. A process of continuous change from a lower, simpler state to a higher, more complex state. A theory that the various types of animals and plants have their origin in other pre-existing types and that the distinguishable differences are due to modifications in successive generations. Now, is it possible, is it possible that we as Seventh-day Adventist Christians have bought into the theory of evolution? Is it possible? Yes. Is it possible where we really believe that maybe we begin here, and this is bad, but bad gets not so bad, and not so bad gets better, and better becomes arrived. Is it possible that we have bought into an evolutionary theory where we believe that now we evolve as a human being to where all of a sudden now we're in a suit and we've arrived? Let's get the definition from the spirit of prophecy. Spiritualism teaches that man is the creature of progression, that it is his destiny from his birth to progress even to eternity toward what? Towards the Godhead. Did you see what that said? Is it possible that we have bought into the lie of the devil? We have bought in to spiritualism. Let's look at it again. Spiritualism teaches that man is the creature of progression that it is his destiny from his birth to progress. I was up in Washington about six months ago, and I asked the same question, is it possible? And someone raised their hand, and they said, well, we do get better. We do get better. And he, he, he Brother Mason, you were, you were there. Was that man sincere? He was very sincere. He believed that we get better. How many of you tonight would be honest with yourselves and say that you believe that tonight? You know what? There's a few honest people in here. I'm telling you, more than will raise their hand will, will, that won't admit that they have bought into this theory that we progress. Amen. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Now let's, let's follow this thing.
Steps to Christ, page 18, says it is impossible for us of ourselves to escape from the pit of sin in which we are sunken. Our hearts are what? Our hearts are evil. And we cannot change them. Who can bring a clean thing out of an unclean? Not one. The carnal mind is enmity against God, for it is not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can be. Job 14, 4, and Romans 8, 7. Education, culture, the exercise of the will, human effort, all have their proper sphere. So in other words, the prophet is saying that education has its proper sphere, culture has its proper sphere, and what does it mean when we say it has its proper sphere? It has its proper place. We need education. We all have culture. It says the exercise of the will. You mean to tell me we can't gut it out? We can't, we can't say, oh, I will to do this and begin to do right? No. What did it say? Human effort all have their proper sphere, but here they are powerless. They may produce an outward correction of behavior, but they cannot change the heart. They cannot purify the spring of life. Now let me ask you kids a question. Are you with me? Let me ask you a question. If all of a sudden my heart is, 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 is diseased and sick, and I, I get a blood transfusion, I put all new blood in me, and it begins to go through the heart, would the blood become contaminated? It would become contaminated. Why? Because my heart is contaminated. That's what the prophet's telling us. That's what the prophet's telling us. Outward correction of Baber, but they cannot change the heart. They cannot purify the springs of life, brother and sister. So if Christ gave every one of us right now a blood transfusion, but we had the same nasty heart, it would contaminate the blood. It would contaminate the blood. So the, 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 the thing that we must focus on tonight is that our heart is evil. We need a new heart. It goes on to say there must be a power working from within, a new life from above before man can be changed from sin to holiness. That power is Christ. His grace alone can quicken the lifeless faculties of the soul and attract it to God to holiness. What is creation? We don't want evolution, amen? amen. We want creation. What is creation? God spoke his words, cre God spoke and his words created his works in the natural world. God's creation is but a reservoir of means made ready for, for him to employ, how quickly? Instantly. Instantly. To do his pleasure. So in other words, brothers and sisters, God has a reservoir, amen? And God spoke and it happened. So if right now, God wants to create something. When he said, let there be light, when he spoke, did there instantly become light or did it become from a dim to a little brighter to a little brighter to a little brighter till all of a sudden it was light? Instantly. Instantly it became light, amen? So that's what we must understand that creation does, not only in the physical world, but in our lives. God wants to create instantly in our lives a new creature in Christ Jesus. Look at this. A new creation in Christ Jesus. Here's the crux of the whole matter. As the sinner, drawn by the power of Christ, approaches the uplifted cross and prostrates himself before it, there is a new creation. How many people in here tonight believe that? Amen. There is a new creation. A new heart is given him. Now, what did he do to get the new creation and to get the new heart? He prostrated himself before the cross. I love what Brother Spears always says. He says, when the rebellion goes out of us, we'll, begin, we'll, we'll quit warring against God. When you prostrate yourself before the cross, brothers and sisters, the rebellion is gone, and you say, this is my king. When we prostrate ourselves before the cross, there is a new creation. A new heart is given him. He becomes a new creature in Jesus Christ or Christ Jesus now look at this holiness finds that it has nothing more to require do we believe that tonight the minute we receive the new heart holiness has nothing more to require in other words the law brothers and sisters has nothing more to require of us the penalty has been paid the price has been paid before that we were sentenced to death but Jesus paid that penalty 
And now he gives us a new heart. It says that holiness finds that it has nothing more to require. God himself is the justifier of him which believeth in Jesus, Romans 3, 26. And whom he justified, them he also glorified. Great as is the shame and degradation through sin, even greater will be the honor and exaltation through redeeming love. So it does, it's saying it doesn't matter where you've been, no matter how low you've been. God can exalt you to look at the position. To human beings striving for conformity to the divine image, there is imparted an outlay of heaven's treasures and excellency of power that will place him higher than even the angels who have never fallen. Can you see that, brothers and sisters? Higher than the angels that have never even fallen. Abide in me and I in you. Abiding in Christ means a constant receiving of his spirit. A life, a life of unreserved surrender to his service. The channel of communication must be open continually between man and his God as the vine branch constantly draws the sap from the living vine. So are we to cling to Jesus and receive from him by faith the strength and perfection of his own character do you see the gift that jesus wants to give us what did it just say he wants to give us his own what his own character now look at this so how do we get it how do we get christ's character i tell you what we need to make this so simple tonight that our children can literally go out and teach this to people i am the what i am divine ye are the what so if i am divine and ye are the branches christ says here's the vine Here's the branch. Now, what, is it, what does it say? As the vine branch constantly draws sap from the living vine, so are we to cling to Jesus. So how does the branch get nourishment? From the sap going up the vine into the branch, amen? So we must, so look what happens. Look what happens. Christ imputes us or inputs us into the branch. Or into the vine, excuse me. He puts the branch into the vine. Now, as he inputs us, now he imparts us. Do you see that? See, because you have to understand. There's some people that simply say that the minute that you all of a sudden get this new heart, you're saved. You don't have to do another thing. But how is it that we get the sap? Look at, the, look at what she goes on to say. He's trying to give us the strength and the perfection of his own what? character the branch is to be grafted into the vine so are we grafted we're input into the vine and to abide there uniting itself with the vine fiber by fiber so brothers and sisters let's get the point here let's make sure we all understand it here's the vine now when the branch might start out it might just be a twig amen but fiber by fiber, as it begins to feed upon Jesus Christ, the branch gets what? Bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. But you must feed upon Christ continually. The branch is to be grafted into the vine and to abide there, uniting itself to the vine fiber by fiber, drawing its daily supply of sap and nourishment from the root and fatness of the vine until it becomes what? It becomes what? One. One with the parent stock. So it's telling us that at some point, brothers and sisters, we're no longer a graft. Right. All of a sudden, we are part of the stock. Right. We are part of this vine. We don't no longer, you know how many people have ever seen, how many people have ever seen where a branch has been grafted into something? They might have sticks holding it up and they got a bunch of tape on it and they got a whole bunch of stuff in order to prop it in so it doesn't fall down, amen? But what this is telling us is that it, it stays there and it's, it's supplied from the root and fatness of the vine until it becomes, becomes one with the parent stock. No longer do you need to be propped up, brothers and sisters. Remember last night when we were looking about that journey with the wagons. And when they got started to get rid of all the things, the wagons and the, and the horses and the luggage and all the things, all of a sudden, 
there was a cord let down. And that cord started out what? Small. Real small. But as they continued to move forward, the cord began to grow until it was the size of the body. And the size of our body. That's exactly what transpires with this branch that is connected into the vine. We must understand that we must live upon Christ. And it, the only way that we're going to actually grow in Christ is to feed on the vine. To feed on the vine. To feed on the Word of God. To, to, to literally assimilate the things from God into this. And then what happens? Young people, what happens? If, if all of a sudden this tree is fed all of this sap, what begins to come on this tree? Fruit. Fruit begins to grow. And that's how fruit begins to grow in your life. It's because you feed upon Jesus and the sap from the vine goes up and feeds the branch. Amen? So look at it. Look with me here. Without the grace of Christ, the sinner is in a hopeless condition. Nothing can be done for him but through divine grace, supernatural power is imparted. This is the imparted part. It's imparted. What is this doing? I don't know what this is doing. But anyhow, how do you get this off, Moses? Without the grace of Christ, the sinner is in a hopeless condition. Nothing can be done for him but through divine grace, supernatural power is imparted. It is through the impartation of grace of Christ that sin is discerned in its hateful nature and finally driven from the soul temple. Do you see that? It's only as we feed upon Christ, all of a sudden we begin to see the ugliness of self to where we want more of Christ. Let me, let me, let me show you what she says. Christ Object, Christ Object Lessons, page 159. Listen to this statement. Listen to this statement. Christ's Object Lessons, page 159. It says, No man can of himself understand his errors. The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? The lips may express a poverty of the soul that the heart does not acknowledge. Did you hear what she said? The lips may express a poverty of soul that the heart does not acknowledge. See, we really don't understand how wicked and nasty we are. Because why? Because we haven't fed on the grace of Christ. We haven't fed of this sap. So we might be professing something with our mouth. We might be saying, oh, I'm so sorry. I'm such a sinner. And the heart is saying, I don't acknowledge that. I don't believe that for a minute. Say all you want. I'm not buying that. Listen to what she says. The lips may express a poverty of soul that the heart does not acknowledge. While speaking to God of poverty, the spirit of spirit, the heart may be swelling with conceit of his own superiority, humility, exalted righteousness. You hear what it said? You can even be praying. You can be saying, oh Lord, I'm so sorry. And the heart's going, I ain't sorry one bit. I'm not sorry one bit. So what you profess with your mouth, your heart's saying, I don't buy it. Look what it goes on. You know what I, lo I love what Brother Mason showed me this morning. <laughs> Listen to this. Let me read that statement again. While speaking to God of poverty of spirit, the heart may be swelling with the conceit of his own superior humility and exalted righteousness. You know what Brother Mason told me? He said, you know what that superior humility is? The religion of humility. In other words, the re religion of humility is when somebody gets to the point where they begin to, dr where their dress becomes a religion, where their diet becomes a religion. The religion of humility. Lord, I'm not like that person. I'm glad I don't dress like that person. Look at me, Lord. The religion of humility. I'll tell you what, we can point just exactly like the Pharisee did to the publican and say, man, I'm glad not, I'm not like that man. Oh, am I glad I'm not like him. Listen to what else it goes on to say. In one way only can a true knowledge of self be obtained. We must behold Christ. You'll never understand how wicked and nasty we are until we behold Christ. Look what she says. It is through the impartation of grace of Christ that sin is discerned in its hateful nature. As we begin to hold, behold Christ, all of a sudden we begin to see how nasty and wicked and sick we really are. I'll tell you what, I'm going I'm to show you tonight. 
I'm going to show you tonight that the vast majority of you in here, if you'll be honest with yourself, do not believe in the Word of God. I'm going to get you to see that you do not believe in this Word of God because of our heart. Our heart is deceiving us. It is so desperately wicked. And you know what? Who can know it? That's saying who can really know it? We got to get to the point, brothers and sisters, we don't trust anything of self. Nothing. And by beholding Christ, it's the only way that we're going to die to self as we behold Christ more and more and feed upon him. We need to die a greater death. It goes on to say, when we contemplate his purity and excellence, we shall see our own weakness and poverty and defects as they really are. We shall see ourselves lost and hopeless, clad in garments of self-righteousness. Like every other sinner, we shall see that if we are ever saved, it will not be through any of our own goodness, but through God's infinite grace. Grace is imparted to us solely as we are connected to the vine. Right now, you know what? In this book right here, Enemy of the Gate. Have we read this book? If you have not read this book, find a way to get it and read it. On page, let me see, I think it's on page, it's on page 14. Joe Cruz says, the will actually contains the main switch which directs all the actions of the human organism. In other words, right here at this point is where the main switch is. You can either turn it on or turn it off. You can either feed on the things of Christ or feed on the things of the world. Right here is where you make your choice. In other words, to make it plain and simple, right here, right there at that point is the cross. That is your cross. To where you will die on this cross to either say, not my will, but thy will be done, and you will allow the grace of Christ to continue to fill you, or you shut it off and you say no. It's like all of a sudden. When you know you should be doing something studying and putting good things in your mind, you cut the TV on and starts watching cartoons. That's how simple it gets. See, if we break it down to where you understand it, then you can start teaching it to the adults. Amen? Amen. It, got, it, it must be simple. We must make a choice in everything we do right here. Here's our cross. And like I told you last night, you're never, ever going to get the crown without the cross. None of us. You must be willing. Let me ask you a question. How many times did Jesus die on the cross? How many times? One time. We got one time. How many times did Jesus die on the cross? Every single day he died on the cross, and that was the only reason that he could get to the real cross of Calvary and stretch out his arms and die for the last time. See, we must take up our cross, deny ourselves, and die daily. Amen? That's how it was that Jesus gained the victory. He was willing to die daily. In everything we do, we must die to self right here. We cannot get this grace. We cannot get this sap to continue to flow while we're making choices that we know are against what God is telling us to do. I'm going to show you tonight, we don't just accidentally sin, brothers and sisters. See, we begin to believe that if God would just do away with the devil, all of us would be all right. The devil's not the problem. Amen. The devil, I'm going to show you, is not the problem. The thought that the righteousness of Christ is imputed to us not because of any merit on our own part, but as a free gift from God is a precious thought. Now get the point. The enemy of God and man is not willing that this truth should be clearly presented. This is the truth that scares the devil to death. The, the foundation of hell begins to rock and shake when this truth comes out. This is the truth that can literally bring the end of the devil. I showed you last night, and for those of you that weren't here, turn with me in your Bibles to the book of Hebrew. To the book of Hebrew. Hebrew. Chapter 11. And let's look at verse 39. Why is it that the devil is so afraid of this subject? Hebrews chapter 11, verse 39. Are we there, amen? Hebrews chapter 11, verse 39. You young people got it? Amen. The Bible says, And these all having obtained... Who's it speaking of these all? 
Those that died in faith, the Abrahams, all of those in the, in the, in the hall of, uh, of faith. All of those in the hall of faith. It says, and these all having obtained a good report through faith received not the promise. God having provided some better thing for us that they without us should not be made perfect. God is waiting for someone to understand this message so they can vindicate the character of God and Jesus can come. 